thought I'd start just with the fundamentals of why you should think about investing in water stock. And this brings it to life basically for you to read later. The fundamental message is it's a stock that is linked to inflation. It's got a strong history of performance. And I think it's actually a stock that if you think about safety towards it, I think this is something you can feel comforted that we will be needed. In a world of climate change, water is needed. We have a long-term mission that will just be needed uh, for many years to come for consumers. In terms of shareholder returns, we've got a strong track record. And what this slide tries to bring out is effectively you can see the FTSE 100, which is the blue. You can see utilities, which you have had a decent period. And then you can see Seven Trent, which has had an even stronger period. So it brings out that if you are in the room and you have held us for a while, a massive thank you. And I hope you're looking at that feeling good about your selection process. If you're in the room and you didn't choose us, you might be thinking, gosh, I missed it. You did not miss it yet. So the opportunity remains, I suppose, when I talk about the future amps and why now is an interesting time to think about water. That's all this tries to do is to bring out some of those facts around long-term utility and also the fact that utilities aren't the same. People often say to me, but if, as long as I've got some utilities, aren't I covered? And maybe, but actually utilities are quite different. And you can see that, I think, most visually from that graph. So this is one of the things that I talk about quite a bit internally and externally, whether it's to all types of stakeholders, is that your performance counts in utilities. We are judged incredibly harshly by everybody, quite rightly, and we're held up in the spotlight more than ever before. And I think that means that an individual company, you can often end up where maybe the shadow of an entire utility sector can cast quite strongly. I think individually, we've actually had a very strong period of time within Seven Trent, and we're confident of continuing to do well over the coming years. So that means, first of all, consumers want cheap bills. We all do. Everybody wants to know that they're paying a very, very fair value. And seven trends are the lowest bills in the land. That is a natural advantage of us in our relationship with our customers. That is helpful. We've actually already committed to make bills even lower between now and 2025. So we're committed not only to having the lowest bills in the land for the last decade, but actually for the coming years as well. And that, again, is a strong message that we see. But it's not just that. It's about making sure that we work hard to deliver that efficiency so that our customers know that every pound is spent wisely. And we've outperformed this five-year regulatory settlement very strongly to get ourselves in a very good cost base to make sure that when the regulator assessed us, they knew that we had a strong cost base and we would receive what's called fast-track status, which is kind of like, almost like being top of the class, right? It's like being at school and suddenly you're singled out and having commendations galore. That's the equivalent, really, of fast-track status. It doesn't come with mass rewards financially. It comes with time. It comes with a halo effect, and it comes with the opportunity to outperform more going forward. We're also desperately trying to make sure that we deliver for all of our stakeholders. And for customers, they've shared that it is the environment. It absolutely is the everyday things that matter. But also, it's about thought leadership in that environmental space. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, around what we think that looks like, and why we're quite excited to be a bit of a leading company in that space. And then you've got to be there for the long term. And I've put a few facts on here that I think should excite anybody that comes to any presentation is, you know, is this company actually doing the right thing for the climate for the long term? We already self-generate 50% of our energy needs, and we're committed to increasing that. We've made some big pledges that I'll talk about a little bit later in my couple of slides. And I think when you look at our capital spend, we need investment in the UK. As a nation, we want to have investment. We want to know that there is capital infrastructure investment. Seven Trends just had its largest year in a decade, 769 million pounds invested. And we can see a strong opportunity going forward with a growing RCV base. And the RCV base is actually in many companies decline over the next while. For Seven Trend, we've got a continuing RCV base growth. And that again is important, I believe, to stock value for the future. So when I look at the next AMP, and you might say, okay, so I've missed this five year period, we call these things AMPs, then you know, what's good about the next five years? And I've listed out here some building blocks. And there's never any guarantees about life, but I suppose to some extent, these are the things that we've either already delivered or we've already given confidence and guidance on that show that we think we've got a really good deck of cards for the next five years. It starts with the bottom. So the regulator has given guidance as to how they see dividends should work utilities. And we, already, we pay actually we're well below what the regulator guidance has given regarding this is what a good company should, should provide. And that is the idea of the 5% dividend plus outperformance. We, even with outperformance with our current dividend policy, we're below their recommendations. We're absolutely in that sweet spot of paying the right amount of dividends in line with our performance. In terms of the sustainability of that going forward, 
we've actually earned ourselves a few building blocks that give ourselves a much stronger deck of cards than, say, five years ago at this exact point. If you do well in water and you outperform on what's called outcome delivery incentives, then you earn extra financials each and every year for your service performance. And we've managed to build up a significant almost war chest of £177 million, which we will take into the next five-year period, which has already been delivered, almost all of that. And effectively, that is through hard work and fantastic customer service on the measures that customers told us they cared about most. And that's secured and will now be taken through into AMP7. When you look at the remaining building blocks, we've landed fast track status. That's agreed with the regulator and gives us a little premium. We've got good performance on financing. As you know, the sector relies on debt. And in order to do that, you have to make sure that you're compared versus your peers. We've managed to get ourselves to upper quartile on financing, having been bottom quartile just four years ago. We're confident on AMP7 ODIs of continuing our strong focus and momentum and track record on delivery. And we've also had a good track record of really looking after all of those pounds, which delivers you, grinds out total efficiencies. It makes the bills lower for customers of the future. It gets rewarded to investors during the course of the current period as well. Now, of course, you've got to judge us on delivery. And I think it's that track record of delivery that led us to say, actually, we think these blue words are what give us excitement about the coming five years. We've got this momentum in our organization on customer service. We're motivated. We think we've seized the day more than anybody else. If you look at the 177 million pounds that we're carrying forward, that's many, it's more than five times more than the next closest company has earned in this five-year period. So we've earned over five times more than the next closest competitor on ODIs in this five-year period, which shows how strong our service performance has been. If we look at Totex, we've saved over 450 million pounds in the last four years in terms of off our operating base. So we understand how to make efficiencies. We don't think we're the perfect article yet. We can still see inefficiencies in our company, and that allows us the opportunity to keep improving over the course of the next few years. On financing, as I mentioned, we've taken our average cost of debt from 5.6% down to 3.9%, which benchmarks well versus the sector of 4.6% being the regulatory set level. On sustainability, we've got a brilliant story that I'm gonna major on now in a second in terms of our ESG arena, so I'm gonna hold on to that for another second. And then people. So people are your greatest assets. That's true in any business. And we are incredibly motivated. As an organization, if you look at any of the measures, whether it's the engagement measures or whether it's just the sheer desire of our people, they're very strong. And I'm going to end today's presentation with a single slide on people. So let me talk a little bit about our ES journey. So we've done well internally, but we failed to share the facts and the statistics externally. So it's almost like being subconscious within our DNA, but we didn't do a good enough job of actually sharing the reporting. To give you one example, um, if you look at one of the benchmarkings with Stenolytics or the, M um, the UK MSXI data, we'd never actually said the words, there are no fatalities. But that's because it was evident to us that we're talking about honing the well-being of our people, having, you know, we're right at the top end and have been up a quarter for years on health and safety. But because we didn't say the word, no fatalities, in our reporting, it was marking us down. So we've had to go through that curve of journey of actually beginning to be much more overt around what we would think of some of the basics to make sure that we're being fair, like for like compared to other organizations across utilities globally. So we've gone through this kind of purpose timeline of almost unconsciously we were doing it. We then chose to actually, our natural purpose desires it, let's gear it up a bit. We then were like, actually, it's not just a desire internally, it's actually what our people want, it's what our customers want for the future, is a more conscious bias through to where we are now, which is that I think we're setting the benchmark and we're now actively trying to announce more to take others on the journey. And to give you an example of one of those things that we have announced, it will be the carbon triple pledge. So only a handful of companies have announced this in the UK. Not utilities, only a handful of UK companies. And the triple pledge is a commitment by 2030 to have 100% of your fleet electric vehicles, to have net zero carbon emissions, and to have 100% of your energy effectively be renewable energy. In our case, we'll create, self-generate the vast majority of that through anaerobic digestion. And the remainder that we can't self-generate, we'll actually purchase in a bit of green energy. So the vast majority of that will be self-generated. This is all to be achieved by 2030. And we're very confident of our plan to deliver that. If you think about the nation, we're mulling over a prospect of a 2050 deadline. And even then, many sectors are struggling and many companies are saying they won't achieve that. I think this just gives one sense of our thought leadership in that environmental space and how we're trying to push forward. 
And then I said I'd end before we go to Q&A, and I'm conscious that you'll have the best questions will come from you guys versus my presentation. So I've deliberately zoomed through my slides to make sure we have good quality Q&A time. But I genuinely believe people are the greatest asset. I think that leadership as, as the chief executive, you can't be everywhere, you can't do everything. But what you can do is you can create the environment where every single person can come in and try and be the very best person they can be every single day. And that's my job. My job, quite simply, is to create the right environment, the right atmosphere, the right vision, the right ambition, and then to support all of my colleagues to then go be absolutely awesome. And that's what I try and strive to do every single day. And some of the examples of where we know that this is beginning to really, really sing, I guess, is first of all, Glassdoor. So actually, we're now a score four company, which is just a handful of companies in the UK get above four on Glassdoor. We're in the top 50 when we were 3.8, so we'll be top 30, I would guess, with a four score. We're in the top 20 in the UK for social mobility. Over 50% of all of our recruits at every level, we deliberately recruit from social mobility cold spots. We're passionate about how you can make a total change to someone's life if you recruit from different parts of the UK. We're top four in Hampton Alexander. That's across all companies in the UK. We have an incredibly diverse workforce in Seven Trent, and I'm not unique, I guess, in terms of being a senior female. Most of our big jobs are done by senior women. We're investing 10 million pounds in a technical training academy one of the only people in the country to believe that actually it's our responsibility to skill up and actually if people then poach our people that's fine large companies should skill up the uk and we're passionate about doing that in our area we believe that every leader needs to be mentally health trained you can't spot the signs in a colleague if you haven't had the training so we're working through a program to get every single one of our leaders properly trained in mental health awareness to support colleagues and catch those issues at the point in time we've been recognized for our leadership on modern slavery and as I mentioned earlier on engagement, we're literally one of the leaders. We're, we're consistently many points above the UK and Ireland average. And of course, if you've got lots of senior women, you've got a pretty low gender pay gap. So that is seven trends in about, what, 11 minutes. That gives us a good chunk of time for Q&A. So you've got to promise not to leave me like a lemon now on stage and all lonely. So I'm hoping that we're going to have some good questions. Oh, brilliant. One at the back straight away. Oh, sorry, I nearly went off process there. Thank you. Um, with regards to the ESG situation, uh, do, do you have a sense of the percentage of your shareholder base that comes from ESG uh, funds or investors? It's, it's a massively growing marketplace, and they're always telling me and others that they can't find anything to put their money into. You know, Amazon is one of the biggest ESG companies in the world, supposedly. Um, and... The second part of the question, if that isn't a big percentage of your shareholder base, do you think it's been affected by the potential change in the uh, political situation in the United Kingdom? So I think there's two things. I recently just finished my global investment investor tour after results. It's perfect timing because I've just seen a huge amount of investors in the last two weeks. Um, there's no doubt that ESG is big in Europe, getting bigger in the UK, um, probably on the journey in Australia and not present in the States. That's my summary of it. If you look at where my share base is held, I've got about 20% in America, uh, about 22% in Australia. I've got probably 6% in Europe and the remainder in, oh no, and then a few percent, 5% percent in Qatar and then the remainder in the UK. So is it, there are some shareholders which are purely there and that's typically some of the Europeans. So the Europeans are much more averse. They have dedicated funds and they're just doing it. That is definitely true. So I would say some of my shareholding base in, in Europe, I think, is probably dedicated. In the UK, if you look at my index-linked funds, where they've got dedicated ESG teams, there's no doubt that's picking up, and I'm seeing increased ownership from them as our ESG metrics are improving as we're reporting better. I don't believe my American base is affected by it, and I'm not sure some of my long-term other UK is. So I think it's a journey. Do I think in two years' time, if my ESG story wasn't brilliant, do I think it would have an impact? I categorically think it would have a big impact. You've got to wait for the mic before he gives me the look. I'm sorry. I'm nervous. There we go. You've just um, as I completed some acquisitions. I'm just wondering, looking forward, what's your, what's your prospect for acquisition in the next four to five years, the next AMP, and how would you see that? Contributing so, to your stock price. So I genuinely believe that um, it's a dangerous situation for companies to believe that growth comes from M&A. So I believe that for me personally and for us as a company, we need to self-generate growth first. You need to look at all of your growth options and decide where's your best growth coming from. 
And there's no doubt that the best growth for us, like in the last dam, will come from self-generated management action on outperforming on ODIs, on Totex, and on financing. So that makes acquisitions either there's a strategic element to it, or you think there is a opportunistic element to it, and that becomes available. So in which case, you would keep your eye, but I think investors in my stock should feel comforted that I'm not suddenly going to do something racy and something international and left field. That's not what investors want from me. My investors want me to be absolutely brilliant, UK-based water company that is shining in my settlement. That's what I'll do first off. They should feel confident that management can deliver and outperform against the regulatory review. And in our sector, you have half the sector does well, um, or I guess makes the base return above, and half doesn't. And then two or three do really well and really push the boundary. That's what I think people should be asking for me first off. We've done two small acquisitions the last couple of years, um, one of which was in energy. And I think our second highest cost base is energy, so it made real sense for us to actually increase and go quicker on, on an acquisition than a self-generated organic growth. And then we made a small acquisition in water where we bought uh, D Valley as was. And the logic behind that is we knew there'd be some synergies and we knew there'd be some growth opportunity, but smallish numbers, we also knew they were good at some measures we weren't good at. And that self-generated growth of your own performance was good. And strategically, we have a good chunk of water comes from Wales. They've got a Welsh license. We liked the idea of securing that relationship ongoing. So I think they're not, you, what you've not seen is a racy period of M&A in the last while. And I think you should expect that I'm focused first of all on outperforming the settlement and doing well for regulatory. Oh, good, the question is just behind you. It's not long for the mic to go. Thank you. You mentioned, obviously, you're going to do a lot of anaerobic energy production. Are you going to do a lot of hydroelectric production as well? And if so, if you generate a surplus, will you sell, uh, sell that back into the grid? So we do sell surplus energy back to the grid every day because we already generate more than we can use in locations that you can't necessarily co-use it in, in both anaerobic digestion and food waste, in um, certainly in a bit of solar as well and a bit of wind. Hydro in the UK isn't big news, right? For certainly my patch. Because the reality is, that if you're in Germany, the rivers move at a flow with the sheer scale of ice and, and snow that comes down that allows that flow activity to really work. In the UK, that's not the rivers we have. So it's a tiny part. It's 1% of my um, renewable energy is hydro, and it's unlikely to get dramatically bigger. So it's likely to be 1% or 2% is hydro. The big opportunities will come from more in anaerobic digestion and possibly more in some of the areas. But I don't think hydro is a big thing for us. So if Corbyn gets to power and nationalizes me, what am I going to do? So a couple of things, right? So first thing is that if you look at, I think, the feedback over the last couple of years, there has been some fair criticism of the sector. And I think that, you know, certainly I wouldn't ever, ever deny the criticism of the Cayman Islands or the heavily geared non-listed companies. And I think that created a shadow. And I think that the sector has accepted and responded to that very strongly. If you look at a few facts, which I think are useful for the debate, um, two years ago, public sentiment was 87% of the public thought the nationalisation was a good idea. That dropped to 44% last year. That dropped to 29% a month ago. So we've seen a dramatic changing in public opinion in the course of that time. Um, second fact we've seen is that we've seen lots of new political parties forming, and nationalisation isn't something that they support. So in that sense, it's a very different dynamic again than it was a year ago, where we had maybe just two front runners as parties that looked, to be fair, organized and with strong individual leaders at that stage. It feels quite different today, doesn't it? So both parties, or the main parties, clearly have had issues, and you only have to look at the most recent elections in Europe to see that the public is frustrated with our main political parties today. No, no, I'm going to get there, don't worry. I'm just saying, just facts. I promise I won't avert the question. I never avert the question. So as Nigel knows, and he hangs me on it every time, but I think these are important facts in the debate because you've got to believe, does public opinion support nationalisation? It doesn't. Definitely doesn't anymore. Are, are political parties influenced by it? I think, yes, they are influenced by public opinion. I like to think so. That's their role. And I think that's important. Um, are political parties as strong as they were a year ago? They're not. So I think, again, that has lessened. I think the bookies had um, a Labour win at... Um, 16% last weekend. So you're seeing a, a different sense again in terms of you know that mood. What's our job? Our job is if Labour get into power and if they then hold, an, hold a parliamentary vote, which they've said they would do, remember, it's not just a straight get into power, it's a they would get into power and then hold a parliamentary vote. If they hold a parliamentary vote, then our job is definitely not to, um, to try and fight against that kind of legislative opinion. Our job then is to make sure that shareholders are fairly valued and that is what you can imagine that we understand. So the first thing is to make sure that political parties understand 
the success of the sector, and there's no doubt on service standards and consumers that this has been a fantastically successful sector since privatisation. It's important that we make sure we work with all political parties to understand their view, because it would require all of them to vote. Every individual MP would have a vote. I think that becomes quite interesting at that stage. And then thereafter, there's a whole host of things. And the best place to look, I think, is Dan Needle from Clifford Chance has written quite a lot about the legal um, situation in terms of the many protections that are available for investors based on that legal situation. And if you haven't got that research, we'd be happy to send along to you. But I think that's a good independent assessment of the legal situation. One last question, Nigel. Oh, he's doing well, he's waiting for the mic. Thank you. An excellent presentation. I'd just like to ask... You have to say that, Nigel, you invited well, it was. It was, in fairness. Whether you think your 177 million of ODIs is sufficient to prevent a dividend cut during the AMP7 period. And I think around saying your ODI number is rather higher than Thames's. Oh, yeah, I think Thames cumulatively are 90 million negative, aren't they? I think is what I read the other day. Um, so, yeah, so the good news is you have winners and losers in our sector, and I think that means it's worth thinking about who you, who you buy into. Um, so I can't give dividend guidance until January next year. And the reason for that is because the financial termination isn't settled yet. And so it would be, it would be premature and the wrong call. So the financial termination gets set in December, and shortly after that, in January, we'll be out with dividend guidance. What we can do, though, is make sure that we look at everything within our power and say, how do we, how do we self-generate returns that protect against possible intervention from a regulator? And there's three self-generated baskets. There's one is getting financing out performance to be positive. This time five years ago, we were bottom quarter. We're now top quarter. There is the 177 million that we've talked about in terms of ODIs, and what else could we do? You can imagine we'll be internally trying to push ourselves quite hard this year to see if there's more that we can do. And then, of course, there's also property, um, which is, an op we've said quite openly, that between five to 15 million pounds a year of property upside will be expected through AMP7. That, again, is something that is quite unique to us. Um, we've got a lot of land, because we used to have to spread the, um, the sludge to the land, because we didn't have access to a sea to pump the raw sewage to a sea. And now we're making that available for housing to try and help the housing situation. That gives a profit situation. And the last area that people sometimes forget is uh, business services, our non-reg division. And actually, there's 35 million a year PBIT um, in the non-reg area. Literally, just a couple of years ago, that was 10 million. So that's come a long way towards that. So I can't give you future dividend guidance today, but I have tried to give you the building blocks around how that decision was made.